last panel, and I thought I would quickly tell you why I think this is a particularly exciting panel, the one that I'm really interested in, in hearing, uh, on the issue of bringing statistics into the courtroom. Uh, we have David Fagman, who has to rank at the top of anybody's list of prominent academic scholars talking about science and law. Uh, David uh, has written extensively and very uh, influentially about uh, evidentiary standards. Uh, and I think the line of work that he initiated over the last few years with John Monahan, Chris Lebogan, looking at the what, what are sometimes called the G to I issues, the difficulty of, of going from the general kind of data that scientists have to the specific conclusions in individual cases, um, that, that come up when experts testify in court are, is, is a very valuable and important framework for talking about the uh, statistics that are associated with uh, forensic science and how we should use those. Uh, David Kay, also on the panel, I mean, if you, if you had to list the top scholars not on science and law, but statistics and law, I think David, well, well he'd pr probably be at the, at the top of the first list and maybe at the very top of the next uh, list, uh, David has been, has been a prolific <laughs> and very perceptive commentator on the use of statistics in connection with forensic science evidence, and particularly good, I think, about writing about the logic of forensic inference, how it is that forensic scientists themselves engage in probabilistic inference to come up with the conclusions that they reach, and how that in turn affects the value of the conclusions and how they should be presented. So, so he, uh, he's great for the panel. Um, let me mention uh, Barbara Spellman as well, Bobby to her friends. Um, she's, uh, I, she's the rarest of all things, somebody who's extremely distinguished in two different fields, first as a psychologist and then later as a, as a legal uh, scholar, um, co-author of, of, I think, the uh, co-author with uh, Michael Sachs of a book on, on the psychology or the psychological foundations of evidence law that I think is, 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 you know, is clearly the leading work linking the two fields and I think her ability to link the two fields is going to be crucial to our understanding how statistics should play a role in the courtroom. Uh, and finally we have uh, A.J. Kramer who is the, public, uh, the federal public defender of the um, uh, District of Columbia, uh, I think he, his expertise is relevant in part because he has long experience for, through himself and his office at how forensic evidence is presented and sometimes mispresented in court. But he's also been very active in efforts to examine, uh, uh, re-examine and consider revisions in the federal rules of evidence, and particularly Rule 702. Uh, and so, which, which raises, you know, which raises again the admissibility question. So it'll be really interesting to hear what he has to say. So, uh, a great panel. I'm going to stop talking so I can hear from them. So, David, take <laughs> first. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, so this is actually something completely different, uh, but not uh, entirely different. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I attend a lot of forensic uh, evidence uh, conferences and symposia, uh, workshops, and we are increasingly tending to point back to 2009 as the place where history began. Um, I'd actually like to make a shout out. Uh, if you go back to the 1980s, uh, there are a number of folks writing on the problems with forensic science, uh, Michael Sachs uh, and, and Michael Reisinger and Mark, and Mark Denbo uh, were writing on the failures of handwriting identification back in 1989, uh, an absolutely wonderful Pennsylvania Law Review article. Uh, and in the 1990s, uh, we, uh, the treatise that I'm one of the co-authors, co-editors of, uh, were extremely critical of everything from bite marks to fingerprints to firearms and tool marks. Uh, so it really was, and then uh, Donald Kennedy in the early 2000, uh, 2000s wrote a, uh, an editorial when he was uh, the editor-in-chief of Science Magazine, Is Forensic Science an Oxymoron? Uh, 
Uh, so 2009, uh, at least from the academic community's perspective, uh, was fairly late in the game. Uh, but what that sort of gives us is a sense of the history of it and how difficult it has been. It's been difficult since 2009 when the National Academies weighed in on it, uh, but it's really been difficult for uh, 30 years uh, where forensic scientists have been told that there is no there there, uh, that in fact the emperor uh, has no clothes, uh, yet they continue to walk down the street uh, without any clothes. So uh, I'll begin with that. Let me uh, tell you that uh, what I'm really looking at is kind of a, a more, much more general perspective on using scientific research in legal decision making and some of the uh, challenges for it. This is a little bit of a scattershot uh, of issues that arise when science and law come together. And so the problem is how do you translate the two? And I really want to concentrate on three basic issues to consider. Uh, the first that's come up a little bit already is this G to I issue, uh, which is reasoning from group data uh, to individual decision making. Uh, I owe that basic insight, as I'll go into a little bit more detail, uh, to John Monahan here at the University of Virginia. I was John's research assistant as a uh, student here at UVA. Um, as I walked in, I walked by the softball field where I had many uh, very happy memories uh, of my time here. Uh, but it's really uh, John and, and Larry Walker that uh, first kind of split the atom on, on the issue of fact-finding uh, and really ad adapted uh, Kenneth Culp Davis's ideas of legislative and adjudicative facts. So a lot of the uh, G to I really uh, needs to be attributed back to uh, their thinking in the 1980s. Uh, also, I want to talk about the difficulty of operational definitions. When I talk about forensic, uh, forensics, not just forensic identification, uh, it's really the application of a lot of research, including psychological research, psychiatric research, uh, to legal problems. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how you define terms, uh, and in particular how scientists define terms versus the way lawyers define terms. Um, and then I do want to get to the question of how you actually present probabilities. And again, this has come up uh, a few times today, of whether judges understand science, whether juries understand science. I, for many years uh, before I uh, took on the dean job, uh, I taught a class with Roger Park, a great evidence scholar, uh, called Scientific Methods for Lawyers. Um, we probably should have come up with a little more sexy title than that, uh, but we still got students to show up. Uh, but I do know from great experience that if you put on uh, a simple formula on the board, uh, students will immediately raise their hand and ask if they're being tested on it. Uh, their eyes begin to glaze over, and, and if it's the uh, drop period, uh, they start moving toward the door. Uh, so there is, I think, a fundamental question, not only whether you have probabilities or statistics uh, to provide and you have an underlying empirical basis, uh, whether those that will be the recipients of that knowledge will actually understand it. Uh, and the muddling through, uh, my plan for my, the next book that I write uh, will be entitled Muddling Through, which is basically the way I see the courts dealing with scientific uh, research and scientific evidence. Uh, and we really need to systematically examine the law's reception of science. So the inherent challenges of, of G to I, that is reasoning from group data and science, individual decision making in the law. Uh, the basic insight here uh, I summarized in, in a book I wrote in 1999. Uh, while science attempts to discover the universals hiding among the particulars, trial courts attempt to discover the particulars hiding among the universals. The point here is that uh, scientists take a fundamentally different perspective or approach uh, to empirical knowledge. They're interested in uh, group data or populations. And what we are interested in, at least in the courtroom typically, is whether this case is an instance of some general phenomenon. Uh, and that divide, uh, which has not gotten the attention that I think it deserves, uh, is a fundamental one for bringing scientific research into legal decision making. So, the first concept is the general, the G, uh, which could be referred to in our recent uh, piece uh, with John Monahan and Crystal Logan at Vanderbilt, uh, we call empirical frameworks, which is based on the social framework concept uh, that uh, John has referred to and Larry Walker referred to back in the 1980s, uh, 
Um, in the medical causation context, courts often refer to this as general causation, but it's not always a causation issue, uh, but it's a general problem. It's a, G to, it's a G problem. So the first question is, does the phenomenon exist in the first place? Uh, and that needs to be answered, and scientists very often, that's what they're studying. So repressed memories, does repressed memories actually exist? Is it consistent with our understanding of brain science? Barry Women syndrome, does Barry Women syndrome exist as a scientific phenomenon? What does it look like? What are the parameters of uh, that phenomenon? Uh, psychopathy, is psychopathy a real uh, concept? Is it a diagnosis, the haircut, mm -hmm. psychopathy checklist? Uh, does it actually capture something about empirical reality? Is Bendectin a teratogen? Uh, that was, of course, the question presented in, in the Daubert case. Uh, does Bendectin cause birth defects? And then you have the question of whether this case is an instance of that general phenomenon. And of course, if the general phenomenon does not exist, you don't ask the second question. Something cannot be an instance of something that doesn't exist. So if repressed memories doesn't exist, you don't ask whether the plaintiff's memories were repressed. Uh, the answer is no, but if there is such a thing as repressed memories, then is the plaintiff an example of that or an instance of that? Sim similarly, uh, does the defendant suffer from Barrett Women's Syndrome? If Barrett Women's Syndrome exists, uh, is the defendant a psychopath uh, with the plaintiff's birth defects caused by Bendectin? So uh, let me just give you an example from the toxic tort area. Uh, let's suppose you have a case where the plaintiff uh, worked for Chevron Corporation for 25 years. Uh, he now has a particular type of leukemia. And he claims that his leukemia was, is attributable uh, to being exposed to benzene over 25 years at Chevron. Uh, there are lots of issues that are presented underlying this. Uh, at what dosage levels will somebody develop leukemia if you're exposed to the benzene? Uh, and the relative risk here is about 20. That's actually more or less accurate over uh, meta-analyses. But there are lots of people with leukemia that were not exposed to benzene, and there are lots of people exposed to benzene that don't suffer from leukemia. Similarly, lots of people that were exposed to tobacco smoke have this type of leukemia. Uh, similarly, radiation, formaldehyde, maybe electromagnetic fields. That's probably a generous relative risk for that. Uh, but the problem in this particular case, at least this type of leukemia that I'm referring to, it's actually APL is where this comes from, 80% uh, of these cases are idiopathic, meaning we don't know what caused it. So the question of whether an individual with leukemia that was exposed to benzene got it, and you can attribute that leukemia from the benzene exposure, especially when 80% of cases are idiopathic, uh, is inherently problematic. Can you say more probable than not uh, as a ultimate conclusion? The same thing is true in the uh, forensic context. Uh, this is just one of my favorite examples coming from California. Uh, there's a population of red Mustangs. The uh, argument in the case is that the perpetrator was driving a red Mustang. That's a base rate problem. There are lots of red Mustangs. Well, we can dig down a little bit. Uh, the perpetrator is driving. This is a people versus Collins kind of thinking uh, that uh, Jed Rakoff was talking about earlier. Uh, you can go even deeper uh, with dead, a dented back fender, uh, with a broken left taillight. Uh, and with fuzzy dice on the mirror. Uh, there's actually a very large portion of ca uh, cars in California that have fuzzy dice. Uh, the same could be true of uh, screwdrivers uh, and tool mark identification. Sears brand 2012 screwdriver with 2.5 centimeter uh, width, uh, with vertical grooves, with slightly greater wear on the left side of the blade, uh, with slight chip on right uh, side of the blade, and with horizontal groove pattern 0.01 to 1.09 above the tip uh, of the blade. So as you go from general, and this is just a, the nature of uh, statistical inference, as you go from the general to the individual, you never get down to the individual. Uh, as the old saying goes, you know, the old saying about, you know, the earth is sitting on top of a, uh, of a turtle. Uh, what is the turtle standing on? Well, another turtle. And what is that turtle standing on? Well, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, that is true here. You never get to the individual. There is no, uh, notwithstanding what forensic scientists like to say, there is no individualization uh, in forensic science. So going on to the inherent scientific and legal challenges, this is a little bit outside the forensic context, the problem of operational, or at least forensic identification, uh, the problem of operational definitions, 
Uh, as most of you probably know, the definition of operational uh, definition itself is, Herbert Feigl put it nicely, uh, to put it briefly, if crudely operational analysis is to enable us to decide whether a given term and the way it is used has a cash value, that is a factual reference. If it does have factual reference, operational analysis show us precisely what that factual reference is in terms ultimately of the data of direct observation. Even briefer, operational definitions are the links between the empirical or descriptive terms of our scientific language and the data of our experience. Well, let's consider a problem in the law, competency. Competency, uh, when I was here, uh, I worked on, with Lois Whitehorn on the competency of children to consent to mental hospitalization. And one of the first problems we, felt, we dealt with was, well, how do you define competency in that context? Well, it turns out that competency is very complicated in, in the law, and there are lots of different types of competencies. Competency to receive a sentence of life without parole, uh, Graham and Miller. Competency to consent to mental hospitalization, that's Parham versus JR. Competency to make an abortion decision. Competency to waive a Miranda rights. Tom Grisso has done a lot of work in that area. Competency to be executed. Uh, Roper, Atkins, Hall, Moore. Uh, and the problem is, how do you define, uh, say, intellectual disability as a competency notion, uh, which is the, um, the Atkins and, and, and Hall and Moore? Uh, but if you go back to Roper, there's a very interesting dissent uh, by Justice Scalia where he criticizes the American uh, Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, for filing briefs that, um, in the abortion context, finding that uh, adolescents that are 14 and older are competent to participate in an abortion decision, yet the APAs uh, filed the brief in the uh, Roper case, which involved the execution of juveniles, finding them not to be competent. Now, of course, it may very well be that the competencies are quite different. It's one thing to say you're competent to participate in a decision uh, as important as an abortion. That's completely different from the question of whether somebody is competent, quote, to be executed uh, under the Eighth Amendment. So defining intellectual disability, just to use this as a uh, concrete example, how do you define intellectual disability for legal use under the Eighth Amendment? Well, the Eighth Amendment, as the Supreme Court has made very clear, embodies two basic legal concepts. One is retribution, and the other is deterrence. So the question is, uh, if somebody is intellectually disabled, uh, are they blameworthy? Uh, is retribution an appropriate principle to apply to them under the Eighth Amendment? And are they, are they deterrable? Do they understand the world well enough being intellectually disabled uh, to be deterred by having a death penalty for uh, uh, murder. So intellectual disability has been defined by the Supreme Court. Uh, it began in Atkins versus Virginia from 2002. Uh, and in Atkins, the court held that the Constitution restricts the state power to take the life of any intellectually disabled individual. But the court left to the states the task of developing appropriate ways to enforce the restriction on executing the intellectually disabled. Uh, so you know you're in trouble when the U.S. Supreme Court starts delegating to the states uh, the definition of a constitutional right, and you know it's going to come back to the court almost inevitably. In fact, I have a new hypothesis about Supreme Court decision making, and that is that most Supreme Court cases come in threes. Uh, then Daubert is a nice example of that, Daubert, Joyner, and Kumho Tyre. Uh, the first case, the court sees a problem, so they get into it, they try to fix it. Uh, they have to then fix what they tried to fix because they actually muffed it up. Uh, then the uh, third case, because they really messed it up in the second case, they try to fix it in the third case, and then they realize that it's not fixable, and therefore they just declare victory and flee the field. Um, a nice example of that is from this 50s, 60s, and early 70s involving obscenity. Uh, the Supreme Court had a number of cases on defining obscenity, and then finally they said, well, Part of Stewart's famous comment, uh, I can't define obscenity, but I know it when I see it, uh, and there has not been an obscenity case since then. Um, Hall versus Florida, the second of the cases, a state cannot refuse to entertain other evidence of intellectual disability when a defendant has an IQ score above 70. And then most recently, Moore versus Texas. The interesting part of Moore is that the Supreme Court came very close, very close, to saying that the standard for intellectual disability under the Eighth Amendment uh, 
is the same as the standard for intellectual disability under the DSM-5, under the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of the Social Sciences. Uh, and that raises a very important question, which is what is the fit between clinical judgments of intellectual disability and Eighth Amendment concerns with deterrence and retribution? Both Justices Alito and Chief Justice Roberts have written uh, in the case law uh, on this issue, and basically what this quote is saying is that the reason why you define somebody, the operational definition for intellectual disability under the DSM is for therapeutic purposes, it's for placement purposes, it has nothing to do with retribution and deterrence. Why would we be using the DSM to define intellectual disability uh, for purposes of the Eighth Amendment by looking at uh, the DSM? And I think I don't typically quote Justice Alito, but I think he's right on this. I think that the question of fit uh, should have gotten a lot more attention uh, from, uh, the, uh, from the courts. Uh, the problem of fit, therefore, uh, under intellectual disability under the DSM uh, requires significantly sub-average intellectual functioning, deficits in adaptive functioning, and onset of these deficits during the development period, and then you have deterrence and retribution. And the question is, what do the DSM factors have to do with the Eighth Amendment factors. Uh, and I would say this area is profoundly under-theorized. It continues to be uh, an extreme mess. In fact, courts don't even agree as to whether intellectual disability is a legal determination or a factual determination. If it's a legal determination, it should be decided by the judge and should be decided pre-trial because the death, de death penalty depends on it. If it's a factual determination, it would be decided by the jury. Uh, I personally think it has to be a legal determination because it's an Eighth Amendment uh, determination and therefore is not an empirical question. So the question is, uh, and this I g give credit to Josh Buchholz, um, his idea of lingua franca, and that is should this uh, law science intersection try to define a common language? And we get back to very basic questions. Uh, as was sort of alluded to earlier today. In Daubert, the court uses the term reliability when they actually mean validity. Uh, should we require courts, or at least expect courts, to use terms correctly in their scientific sense of it? What about insanity versus mental illness? Uh, Judge Bazelon, uh, back in the DC Circuit, tried to match up insanity with mental illness uh, with the Durham test. It didn't last very long. Uh, and it was a real failure, the idea that you'd have a single test between what psychiatrists think is uh, mentally ill and what the law considers to be insane uh, turned out to be highly problematic. So what did we do? We went back to an 18th century notion of, of insanity. Um, and then um, muddling through, just to talk about presenting statistical probabilities in court, one of the problem here is basically that you have a group, you have group data and you have to make a categorical decision. That, that's a fundamental problem uh, about an individual case. And so one of the questions that has come up for me is, well, in what other context do we do that? Well, we do that in lots of different contexts. Suppose you're the governor of Florida and you have to decide whether a storm that's on its way toward Miami uh, means that we should evacuate the city of Miami. Big deal, uh, evacuating the city of Miami. Uh, well, there are two types of error you can make there. You can evacuate the city and the storm doesn't hit. Well, you fail to evacuate the city and the storm does hit. Uh, so what do you do? Well, if you're the governor, you call in your scientists, your meteorologists, and you say, what do I do? This is category five strong, fifth strong, strongest uh, Atlantic hurricane on record. Uh, do you evacuate Miami? Well, the scientists might say, well, we our models give us 95% confidence that there's a 45% likelihood that a Category 5 hurricane is going to hit Miami. Uh, and the governor says, well, should I evacuate or should I not? And the scientists will say, our models indicated 95% confidence that there's a 45% likelihood that a Category 5 hurricane is going to hit Miami. And the governor says, do I evacuate or don't? Well, what we actually do, and these are very nice probability maps, we give the governor and we give the people uh, some sort of uh, pictorial representation of what we're talking about uh, in terms of the statistics and likelihoods uh, based on the data that we have, and obviously collecting the data itself has error associated with it. So in terms of translating uh, scientific finding for purposes, you have the G to I problem, and the first problem is actually getting at G. The second problem is actually getting to I and using uh, different uh, notions of um, diff what's called sometimes differential etiology. 
One other point I just want to raise is uh, the different sensitivity and selectivity considerations between science and law. We saw some people talking about rock curves and sensitivity and specificity today. Well, if you're a psychiatrist and you're deciding whether somebody is schizophrenic uh, and what you're going to do is give them a drug, give them Seroquel or some drug, uh, your regret matrix, the, the, the possibility of making a mistake, it's like, well, I'm going to give them a drug, I'll see if they, have, uh, if they respond to it, if they have uh, you know, uh, some sort of negative effects because of it. Uh, and so I have a very low concern about making a mistake in that context. If I have to decide whether they are, quote, mentally ill for purposes of locking them up, meaning simply committing them uh, for two years, well, my concern about a false positive there should be much higher. And, and, and what, when we ask the question, and we still ask the question, to a reasonable degree of psychiatric certainty, does this person suffer from schizophrenia, we ought to be more specific. The question is, to a reasonable degree of what type of scientific certainty? Are we talking about giving a drug, or are we talking about uh, denying somebody of their liberty? And that's uh, the, the differences in sensitivity and specificity, I think, are, are quite important in, the, in that context. And with that, thank you. All right, any, any, any quick questions for David? Not. Uh... Sure, in the back, standing up. I think it's a great question. Uh, hard to answer in the abstract, but I think that if the spaghetti plot, so very often you see uh, the spaghetti plots being the American model versus the European model, and I actually thought about using uh, those plots, and, and I always wondered what's the difference between those two models. In, in my perfect world, I, I think that generally if they, they are supported by good empirical data, uh, and I assume the European and American models are both, but that they have different operating assumptions or they're collecting data differently. Uh, and as long as those are explained, then I would say uh, that ought to go to the jury. Um, in my ideal world, as I was going to say, is you'd have a party expert on one side, you'd have a party expert on the other, and I'd want a court-appointed expert in the middle uh, to, uh, on the admissibility side, to sort of maneuver through uh, those two different modeling uh, approaches, uh, because I think that court, I don't have a great deal of faith in the court's understanding what is the underlying input uh, in those particular models. But yeah, I, I, otherwise, otherwise, as long as they're well supported, I would say they'd probably be admissible. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we better move on to David Kay uh, next, but I, I, we'll hopefully have some time for discussion further in the, at the uh, end of the session. Well, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for still being here, and particularly the organizers for uh, inviting me. For years, I've been thinking about the question of conveying information to juries of a scientific or statistical nature, and I've developed, as I get older, increasingly strong opinions. Um, but I hope I can still be talked out of them. But let me tell you. Uh, what I, and I'm going to focus on the, the forensic identification context. Um, but here are some ideas. Um, and if I can uh, have only one slide, I guess, this, this would be it. Because I think we need to make a number of distinctions when we think about uh, what information is developed and what information fact finders need. 
Um, I want to distinguish between data on the one hand and evaluations or assessments of data on the other. Uh, that data can be observations, it can be measurements. Uh, evaluations can come in two different forms. That's my next distinction. Uh, on the one hand, conclusions. The storm is going to hit Miami with a probability of 0.45 at this strength. Or statements of evidentiary value of how uh, probative the evidence is of a storm of such a kind. And let me illustrate these points with, uh, first of all, the distinction between data and inference, if you like, but with non-evaluative testimony that we don't talk about too much. Hair microscopy we've heard referred to, well, I don't think there's much doubt that there are differences among hair fibers and the variability on, on many features uh, and on the composite is greater among different individuals than among different hairs of the same individual. I'm not saying we have a quantitative model of any of that, but that can lead to, at a minimum, features-only testimony, which I found, for example, in one case where the court uh, decides, well, it's all right because the jurors were free to make their own determinations. They saw these photographs of the differences. Now, ironically, this is a case of a person who was exonerated, the hair didn't really match. Um, but still, if the scientist, I'm going to argue, is not doing anything unscientific in presenting that information, whether the legal system can make sufficient use of it, whether jurors can understand the rarity, the specificity, and so on, it's a different question. And to me, that's a Rule uh, 403 question more than a Rule 702 question for the lawyers in the audience. But similar feature testimony occurs with all kinds of evidence. I won't go through these examples. Um, but of course, if we're going to really make use of evidence, we can't depend on juries to figure all this out on their own. So evaluative evidence, evidence in which the expert uh, presents some kind of a conclusion, is the major current category. For example, from the Department of Justice's draft Uniform language on testifying in reports uh, for glass evidence, material evidence, was a statement that, well, look, if you can put the pieces back together in a jigsaw puzzle, you can testify that that's the source. And I just want to raise the question of why? Why should criminalists opine on the truth or falsity of hypotheses like that themselves as opposed to simply saying, here are the pieces, they fit together, you've all had some experience with glass, maybe this is a little different than the hair case, and this would be good enough for the legal system. But what's the expertise in this field? Now, that contrasts a little bit with some other fields um, where there is evidence that uh, experts perform better even on purely subjective categorizations than do lay finders, lay fact finders. So the Departments of Justice's uh, UTLR for latent prints uh, simply codifies present practice uh, with drawing a categorical conclusion uh, and then has explanations that are somewhat internally incoherent. Uh, <laughs> handwriting as to what it might mean, but handwriting common to have a qualitative scale of probabilities ranging from elimination to identification, strong probably, et cetera, in between. We get quantitative conclusion testimony in some fields. Uh, one of my, one, an interesting case arising in Georgia, for instance, involving remains uh, and testimony about the remains being those of a girlfriend and the fetus uh, with a probability of paternity of 96.3%. Uh, that presupposed, speaking of assumptions, a prior probability for the Bayesians in the audience of 50%, which is why I call it POP50. Um, but that's the testimony. The court in that case excluded it because the expert also said a reasonable degree of scientific certainty requires a posterior probability of 99.99% in this field. The match of that, the fit, as uh, David Fegman was just saying, between legal concepts and 
scientific ones is very poor in that example. But we can get lots of, of extreme probabilities like that. I want to move then from all of these categorical judgments, whether qualitatively modified or quantitatively modified or just with no statement of uncertainty, to, thank you, evaluative evidence. Uh, and if we want to present it that way, we could say in the kinship case, in the remains case, well, it's 26 times, now I'm going to channel Henry Swafford, right? It's 26 times more likely to see these genetic markers, these alleles, uh, if indeed this guy was the father and this woman was the mother in the fetus than in the uh, limited alleles we could find. Otherwise, maybe we can give the components of the likelihood ratio as well. Here's a really fascinating case that I want to spend a minute on because uh, it's one that has considerable <laughs> historical significance. And let's see, where is, why won't this start? Nope. Different programs give different results. Well, let's just put it this way. <laughs> An anthropologist at the University of Tennessee, uh, well known in the field, recently produced data that uh, produced an analysis in a forensic anthropology journal that was picked up in the media, particularly by Fox News, which came up with this wonderful headline of disappearance 99% solved. And the BBC described it as a 99% match. What they were talking about was the anthropologist's personal probability of 99% that certain bones that were recovered from an island at the time, 350 nautical miles from where Amelia Earhart was supposed to land, were actually hers uh, on a, a Nikamaruru bone island on that island. Uh, he used photographs and clothing of hers to infer what her bone lengths might be. A lot of uncertainty there. Uh, and then the reported lengths at the time in the 19, early 1940s uh, and reduced the, the uh, differences in the skeletal lengths to a nice statistic, a summary of data. And then observed that with respect to a reference sample of over two, almost 3,000 Americans of European ancestry, um, she ranked uh, among the top percentage in similarity. Uh, then he did some bootstrapping for the statisticians to get some, and, and converted things to likelihood ratios and came up with a minimum of 84 for a likelihood ratio. And the same paper contains the statement, the likelihood ratios mean that the bones are at least 84 times more likely to belong to Earhart than a random individual. <laughs> Now, that would be true if we had mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive hypotheses, perhaps. Obviously, we don't. What if the bones came from a Micronesian? In the article, he dismisses all that as improbable and leaves us then with this 99% figure, although he later argues that, in fact, in a Bayesian sense, it's justified because we should have a high prior probability that it's this island. But now, this is going to be my point, and actually I probably won't get beyond this in the interest of time. Think about how this should be presented in court. My argument is, it's fine. He can defend his 84% likelihood ratio if he wants, acknowledging that it's not considering all other hypotheses. By my calculations, if you throw in Micronesians with a probability of 10%, uh, a priori, you reduce the final probability from 99% to 80, 89, but in any event, he can do that. He can explain it's much more likely to get this similarity in bones from this group than from that group, and then let the jury figure out what that means. What he can't say, what he shouldn't say is that, well, uh, you know what, the, there are lots of reasons to think that the plane uh, went down there, notwithstanding, well, for example, a woman's shoe was found on the island, it was said, that's pretty powerful. On the other hand, strong radio signals were coming from a very different spot, very close to where she was supposed to land. Um, and so other aviation, aviation experts say, probably not that. The Navy searched the island at the time and didn't find anything. 
So this is just like information which the forensic anthropologist has no scientific basis for assessing qua forensic anthropology, but which the fact finder needs to know. The fact finder can then use the fact that the bones are much similar as shown by some plausibly computed likelihood ratio. They are, the, that similarity is such that it would arise more often under one condition than another. And then we leave it to the jury to decide. And that's the legal argument. It's not the formula of Bayes' theorem per se, but the separation of priors from likelihoods. Now, that's more complicated than I've indicated, but I'm going to stop. Thank you. OK, great. Let, let me ask a quick question, sort of moderator's prerogative. So, so David, I mean, the, the National Commission on Forensic Science has put out a document suggesting that forensic scientists should restrict their consideration to what they call task-relevant information, that is, information relevant to the scientific task. So, so experts on latent print analysis should be drawing conclusions by comparing prints, and experts on forensic anthropology should be looking at bones. Um, but if the if the expert's going to be doing any kind of sort of Bayesian approach, the expert is going to have to be uh, drawing conclusions or making assumptions about priors. And if we're talking about the priors, that two items have the same source, the, the priors will, are going to have to involve um, information well beyond what the commission says is task relevant. So, I mean, are we in a dilemma? Is there, is there, is there any way for a forensic scientist to uh, express conclusions about source probability without getting into things that are beyond the scientific domain and encountering the problems you've discussed? Or should they just never give testimony of that type? Sort of yes, but let me go back to People v. Collins and to a suggestion that you well know and the evidence scholars in the room well know because Sorry, the case the is... The issue and I will worry is the yes. So <laughs> guess what? Yes, let me continue, um, the, and I'll get back. So yes, the scientists should, con con should confine themselves to the scientific data. To yeah. the extent that they rely on other data, that has to be made very clear if they're going to do that. Now, um, what I was then going to say is to go back to Amelia Earhart. Um, the, uh, Dr. Jantz also uh, noted that um, the, the convention in the field of forensic anthropology should be to present the results and, and if you want to pick a prior probability. So post Collins, we've had the suggestion that why not give the jury, for example, statements like, well, if your prior were 10% or 20 or 30, that could go, that, that would then lead you to this posterior. But the expert, even in that system, and you've done studies, and David did a study of that, even in that system, the expert is not selecting the prior for the jurors. And in the paternity area, in civil cases, that is exactly what the state of Oregon requires based on an article that I wrote um, a long time ago in 1979. Plemel as a primer for paternity? Uh, yeah, that was that a follow-up, but right, right which said at least give them a chart. Now the problem with doing that in the forensics area where we get probability, where we get likelihood ratios like 9,543, is you get a very flat line. You get, unless you start with a very small prior, pro posterior probability is practically one. So I'm not enamored of that solution, but I do want to conceptually separate prior odds from strength of evidence. And I would like the forensic analysts to address Strength of evidence, how powerful is our evidence, not what do I believe as an individual yeah. the evidence has proved without knowing everything I should about the case. If I were to be the fact finder, I'm not the fact finder, I'm an informant. Okay, so maybe take one question, then we better move on. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in how you can justify a distinction which very intuitively appealing between data and evaluation when in most forensic sciences, the data phase, as you call it, isn't some sort of objective, reliably empirical sort of selection of features. Where it itself is 
for most forensic techniques, utterly subjective, without standards, without guidelines, that that itself, the selection of the data, what is relevant, is itself evaluative. And that's the problem we see in the features only testimony. You're not getting a list to the fact finder of every feature, you're getting features that the examiner thinks are probative, are relevant. Giving any amount of that testimony is communicating something to the fact finder about the value of the features that are being shown. Certainly the fact finder, the, juries, the jury in Reed, didn't think, boy, I'm getting just a list of every feature in this hair. This examiner is telling me I saw this ovoid body, I saw this diameter, because it is relevant and it means something about the connection between this hair and that defendant. So how do we draw a distinction between data and evaluation when it boils down to the same subjective judgment at the end of the day for most techniques? So it's, ah, if you jump to the conclusion as your evaluation overall, then it begins to look like it's the same thing. But there are two steps, both of which I will agree involve some kind of interpretive process on the part of a uh, perceptive being. So, Data does not just come free, all right? It, it, William James taught us that there's a bloody, booming, buzzing confusion out there. We extract information as human beings, and then we ask, and that's gonna be my feature determinations, but I can say this is what I've got at that step. If you wanna call that evaluation, that's fine, but it's not an evaluative ultimate conclusion. So maybe, if, I don't want to change my terminology too much, but we'll call that an evaluative step, if you like, to get the data. Then we evaluate the significance, the import, the probative value of the data, or we evaluate it to draw an ultimate conclusion about the source. So I think there's a difference at that point, but I agree with you that there's an involvement, an interpretive process where human beings are doing this in both situations. If we had a computer program that do it, you might tell me the computer is doing evaluation because somebody programmed it to look for those things. And that's just built into it. But don't you think it's true that even if a, if a hair examiner is just giving what you call features only testimony, that that testimony by its nature is communicating something about the pro, that, that the features he identifies, he or she yep. identifies, have probative value, that they actually mean something? Yes, that, that they are worth looking at. Okay, well we better um, move from uh, William James to uh, A.J. Kramer so we can continue uh, the discussion. I think that hopefully there'll be more time for discussion um, at the end of the panel. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I feel like I should give you a true introduction so you'll know some about my credibility. I was recently introduced at the courthouse in an event by the chief judge who said that she had checked the records of the court in D.C. and that I had tried and lost more cases in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia than any other lawyer. <laughs> I had argued and lost more appeals in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit than any other lawyer, and I had topped that career off with a nine to nothing loss in the Supreme Court. So you have some idea of, of where I'm coming from. Um, You're number but, one. <laughs> but um, I, I want to say, um, that I, when Judge Rakoff's uh, speech at lunch, there's a lot uh, of what he said that I agree to. Uh, as far as I can tell, the bottom line is for um, uh, scientific expert evidence. If it's the government that wants it, it comes in. And if the defense that wants it, it's, it wants it, it doesn't come in. And I agree with him that there's a lot of work to be done by defense lawyers that's not being done uh, for money reasons, for time reasons, for other reasons. I'm hopeful the Supreme Court decided a case about two months ago saying that a defendant had an absolute right to an independent expert. For a, that case involved a psychiatric examination. The defendant in state court, it's a state court case, had been given an independent, had been given no independent expert but had to rely upon the state's expert and the Supreme Court said that that violated the defendant's rights to have their own independent expert. So I'm hopeful that that case might spur defense lawyers on to more. There is another factor um, going on and that's the fact that 97, in the federal system, 97.3% of the cases plead guilty. State systems, it's very similar, it's above 95%. If, there was a, if courts allowed a lot of challenges to scientific evidence and started finding it um, unreliable or inadmissible, 
the plea rate would go way down, the trial rate would skyrocket, and the systems would be overloaded and swamped, and the criminal justice systems would come to a halt. I can't help but feel that some of the reasons for admission of evidence are to show, and you get, if you get a, a fingerprint report, and it says that the defendant's fingerprints were on an item, that, you go to the defendant and you show them that, and that tends to lead to plea bargaining very quickly in the case. If, if that was not as readily admissible as it was, and you have to remember back after Daubert in 2002, Judge Pollack in Philadelphia found that fingerprint evidence did not satisfy admissibility uh, into evidence under Daubert, and immediately you would have thought that was the end of the world. The FBI and the DOJ came in and filed reams of papers saying how wrong that decision was, how it was going to disrupt the criminal justice system, how it overturned centuries of scientific evidence and shook the foundation of our nation as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, and Judge Pollack going, and I'm very sad to say, went along with the motion for reconsideration, held that the fingerprint evidence was admissible, and since that, that litigation effort was spearheaded by the Federal Defender Office in Philadelphia and several other Federal Defender Offices. And since then, it's almost like there was a deflation. Defense lawyers um, tried and keep trying on scientific evidence, keep getting rebuffed, and it, it, it just, it has an effect that, but people, I, I'm happy to say I don't share Judge Rakoff's pessimism. I think defense lawyers are still trying to do it and still trying to come up with challenges to scientific evidence. And also you have to remember, and I, I'm, I think it's wonderful to hear all the people from the labs who are here telling us uh, how they want to make everything better, and that, that's true. Um, but you have to remember where all this came from. Um, in, it's not that long ago. In 1984, there was a bike, uh, an article about bite marks matching. It said the chances of a bite mark matching were one in six trillion. That, last I checked, that's a lot more people than there are in the world. And if you're, in a, if you're a defense lawyer and it comes, an expert says the chances of it being anyone else are one in six trillion, you have a heavy incentive to plea. Of course, that's been completely debunked now. And after empirical testing, it's down to about one in six. That's quite a big change. In 1984, appropriately, both of these are in 1984, I guess, um, <laughs> DOJ said fingerprints were infallible, is the word DOJ used, that fingerprints were infallible, uh, even though at the time they had never been subject to empirical testing at that time. And not that long ago, in 2006, the FBI said sh the FBI said shoe print evidence was accurate to one in 683 billion. Again, unless there's a lot of Imelda Marcoses in the world, that's probably <laughs> more shoes than exist in the world. And now um, there's been no actually empirical testing even now on shoe print evidence to to give that any credence. So this is where it all started. I'll, I'll give you one more example that's been that's a really terrible example. Shaken baby syndrome. There was a coroner in Mississippi who was famous for his testimony about shaken baby syndrome. Shaken baby syndrome said that if there were three items present, bleeding in the back of the eye, bleeding in the layer of the brain, protective layer of the brain, and um, one other thing, sorry, brain swelling, that could only be due to shaken baby syndrome. A person was convicted based on this testimony in 2009, not that long ago, and yet since then, in just the last nine years, it's determined that the same symptoms can be caused by infections, genetic conditions, and short falls of a baby, just a little fall of a baby. That person is, and the, the expert also testified that a textbook debunked any criticism of shaken baby syndrome, and that there was a test that showed the empirical reliability of it. The textbook said exactly the opposite. The empirical test, nobody has ever been able to find its existence, and yet that person's still in jail awaiting a hearing on their case. There's another conviction from 1999 also, that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals said that the coroner gave false testimony about it, that the science has been debunked, and yet the person's habeas petition was filed too late. So they sit in jail having been convicted based on false testimony and an unreliable scientific uh, testimony. So I give you that as a defense lawyer. Um, I want to put on a different hat for just a couple of minutes. I'm a member of the um, U.S. Judicial Conference Advisory Committee on the Rules of Evidence. Uh, 
There was a symposium held last October um, about scientific evidence at which some of the people in this room came and testified. And what was remarkable, I think, and I have to give the disclaimer that Henry gave, uh, I speak only for myself. I don't speak for the committee. The committee speaks only through its uh, issuance of rules or other written materials. Um, the, what was remarkable was that the academics, the experts, the professors, um, the judges all testified that what's really going on is that Rule 702 is not being followed by the courts, that they're misinterpreting Rule 702. The FBI and the DOJ also had people there. Their response was, everything's fine. There's no problems at all. It's all working as it should. So the committee is trying to figure out um, if there can be some amendment to Rule 702, and that's just open. Uh, extremely divergent views and how the committee could respond and there's all kinds of rules about what the committee can and can't do and I, it's up for the there's a meeting at the end of April and rule 702 is back on the agenda um, for that meeting and to try to figure out but the consensus is that courts are just not following rule 702 and admitting in um, large amounts of evidence that should not be admitted that have never been subject to empirical testing um, that should not be admitted. Um, so that's the main problem from the rules of evidence perspective. Um, there also, as you know, the reasonable degree of certainty. Uh, the, the National Research Council says that has no scientific meaning um, and should not be admitted. Even Judge Rakoff, though, admitted fingerprint testimony recently in a case, but <laughs> said that the examiner couldn't testify about the, could only testify more probable than not and not give a percentage. Um, he kept out handwriting analysis. It turns out handwriting analysis that lay people can do handwriting analysis with almost the same um, results as uh, expert examiners. Um, and then I just want to mention two more things about the future of um, this. The, uh, you heard some mention of algorithms, and algorithms are used now in court to uh, basis of to release people pretrial and to also predict recidivism. And there was a recidivism study that was done recently. And the algorithm that was used used 137 different factors for, to predict if somebody would recidivate. They did a random, they recruited people randomly online to do a study. They gave them two factors to determine if somebody would recidivate. It turned out the random online people predicted correctly 67% of the time with these two factors. The algorithms with 137 factors predicted correctly 65% of the time, 2% less than the random with two factors. Um, the other thing I want to, there was, uh, the other thing that's going on now, so algorithms have gone now. Synthetic drugs have also become a big issue, and recently there was a case about synthetic drugs, and the examiner from the DEA lab testified um, that he had tested the drugs and they had the same chemical comparisons, and he was asked, how did he make that decision? And he said, I consulted other, other, um, I'm not, am I over my time? Oh, you're getting there. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, know, I didn't know it was going to buzz. <laughs> um, and uh, the, um, he testified that he talked to other examiners in the DEA lab about whether Sorry. that analysis was correct. And of course, when, and I, I think Henry talked some about this, when you have law enforcement labs reinforcing their own uh, conclusions, you have a real problem. Um, the, the only um, other thing I want to say is don't underestimate the human value. I can give you three human uh, part of this whole thing. Massachusetts has thrown out thousands of convictions because the main chemist in the Massachusetts drug lab was simply falsifying tests. They're about to throw out 3,000 more convictions next week. We had in D.C. an FBI agent who was found in his car, passed out, with bags of evidence from all different cases in his um, car that he had decided he wanted to try various of the drugs that were contained therein. <laughs> um, and most recently, the Dulles DEA lab um, had two chemists from the Dulles DEA lab decided that while they were sampling the um, drugs for, uh, uh, for analysis of the drug contents, they would also sample the drugs themselves um, for their own consumption. So, and the government sat on that for four months before they let us know what was going on at the DEA lab. So never underestimate the human factor there. Henry, I was quite impressed by your last slide. 
about what you are aiming for, and, and I think that that is what we should all be aiming for. I do want to just tell you, I'm not sure that non-disclosure agreement's a good idea right now. They've gotten some bad publicity <laughs> recently. Um, but, but, but I think that, that your last slide there was what everybody should be aiming for. Thank you very much. That's great. Okay, thanks, AJ. Let's move on to Bobby. Yeah. I have a question while I set up. Oh, <laughs> Dale, got it for me? All right, while well, Bobby's setting up, any quick questions for Mr. Kramer? Okay, uh, thank you all for sticking around. Um, since I'm the last person, Brandon asked me to keep it short, so I decided to use lots of pictures because, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words, so maybe I'll get all my words in that way. I want to talk about talking to real people about forensic statistics, and I am actually disappointed in the gentleman before me because I wanted to see more equations so that I could make more fun of them, but just think of them having lots of equations floating around their heads because that's what they really wanted to tell you about. So as we have known, all of us from listening today, from our lifetimes, from any psychology courses we might have taken in our lives, we know that humans are really rational, we're great reasoners, we never forget anything, we consider all possible interpretations of events, we're really good at the rules of formal logic, we can do complicated mathematics in our heads, and we think statistics is easy, easy and obvious, right? Like, we all, we all know that? Yeah. Okay, well, maybe not, right? And so decades of psychology and decades of living has taught us and me that maybe we're not so good at all this stuff all the time. But it does seem like people do amazing things that must involve incredible amounts of ca calculation. So here we have an outfielder, and he's catching a fly ball, and look at all these things. He's got some linear algebra, and he's got some physics, and he thinks the ball's going really fast. So he's got some Einsteinian equations, and that's what he's doing in order to catch the ball, right? What else could it be? Well, it turns out that's not how it works. Uh, here's how it works. I'll do the calculations. Damn, I forgot to add the decimal point. It doesn't work that way. And uh, what psychologists and others have figured out is that there's actually a simple heuristic way to figure out where the fly ball is coming, and that is to watch it for a bit and to position to yourself so that you can see where it looks like the ball is sort of going straight. It's hard to explain, but you actually know how to do it, a lot of you, rather than the arc, and then you put yourself at the end of the trajectory that it looks like to you, and you will end up there, and you will catch the ball. So maybe humans aren't rational, but we often act in a way that does seem rational. So I can go through this in zero time. In the olden days, it used to be we thought about the rational man. This was 1950s and 60s. The man part, you better take seriously there. In the 70s and 80s, psychologists were thought, thinking about how there are so many findings that humans aren't rational in different ways. A whole set of things called heuristics and biases. If you know anything about Danny Kahneman and his, his recently famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow, right, it encapsulates all this stuff, that we make a lot of mistakes when we, we reason. In the 80s and 90s, people were going berserk in research finding different ways that people are bad reasoners. But it turns out that now we're starting to appreciate more that people are, in fact, good reasoners most of the time. Maybe we're not rational according to those definitional rules of statistics or probability or logic, but we're not stupid. And the decisions that we make make sense a lot of the time because the heuristics that we use make sense a lot of the time, and they work in the environments that they're supposed to work in. Okay, with that background, let me ask you the question. Um, is forensic evidence somehow special? Should we think of forensic evidence as being different from the sorts of um, statistics and math and stuff that we deal with every day through the heuristics and uh, background knowledge that we've developed. Is forensic evidence special because it's scientific, so it's different from other evidence? Is it special because people don't understand the underlying processes, right? What goes into a fingerprint match? What goes into a uh, drug match? Um, is forensic evidence special because it involves numbers and statistics? 
So the short version of what I like to argue is let's leave statistics to the experts and stop torturing the fact finders. Let's not give them all the mathy stuff that I thought these guys were going to talk about giving them, all the probabilities, all the likelihood ratios, all the stuff like that, where if you were sitting on a jury, you would, well, not many of you, but imagine your sister or your mother or your grandmother or your friends sitting on a jury, are they going to really want to sit and pay attention to all that stuff? So I think that likelihood ratios and random match probabilities are terrible ways to present information. When I used to teach over in the psych Except department, the I used to teach statistics mm -hmm. and, and research methods to undergraduates. And day after day and month after month, I'd be trying to teach them what a p-value is and how with the probabilities that we learn here are not the probabilities you want to know. You want to know how likely is it um, that the, the probability of hypothesis, the probability of the thing you want to know given the data. So if this is how good the, the uh, science looks, is this is how good your fingerprints look, oh, I want to know the probability that the guy's really done, or at least that these fingerprints really match it. Um, but no, that's not what you get. You get the probability of, given the evidence, um, how likely it is that your hypothesis is true. And so this happens when, when we try to teach students in, um, in the psych department that we don't know how likely it is that two things are different. We only know how likely it is if two things were the same, you would get this evidence or evidence more extreme. They're like, why do I want to know that? I really want to know if the way I taught people to memorize things really works. I really want to know if people differ, differ in all kinds of different characteristics. So we're not telling people what they want to know. And that is bad because what they often do is they convert the things that we're telling them into the things that they want to know. And that's why I was, somebody, was hoping somebody would talk about uh, prosecutor, prosecutor's fallacy or prosecutor's fallacy or something like that. Um, another thing that we know about statistics is that false precision is dangerous. And if somebody gets up there and says, oh, it's 6,224,312 to one that such and such, they're going to believe you a lot more and take this very, very seriously than if you just say 600 million or one, to one or something like that. Or if you have lots and lots of decimal points, it's, they're thinking that your accuracy and your certainty is way more than if you don't have lots and lots of <coughs> decimal points. And the funny thing is, is as many people who've spoken today have, have said, you know, we're giving them these numbers, but we're not really sure that they're totally accurate. We have some kind of confidence interval around them. We know there's some kind of variability in them, but you know, we have to give them a number, so we give them this one. But if you give them that one, um, and it's not totally accurate, and, but you're giving them this, this false precision, then you're doing sort of double damage. Um, another thing that bothers me about trying to give uh, very, very specific information and statistics is that the probability of it, there being a mistake is order of magnitudes bigger than the probability, at least in DNA and say fingerprints, that you've gotten some kind of mismatch in the laboratory itself. By the probability of a mistake, I mean, who talked about this? Uh, Peter talked about this. The probability of a mistake, that they picked up the wrong thing at the crime scene, that it got messed up, some, there was some inversion, that it just got labeled wrong, something like that. That the probability of that is so much bigger than these small probabilities that we're talking about being similar enough to call it a match which I'll get to in a second, um, that these other things have happened is so much greater, it doesn't even matter that we are fidgeting around these very, very tiny numbers in a very big way. So related to what I just said is another thing I think we need to do if we're talking to juries about this information is to remove jargon and repair misconceptions. So we should avoid words that have different meanings to lay people than they do in the, in, to experts like match or individuation. When people hear the word match, they think it means this person and only this person, and there's no other chance that it belongs to any other person. We need to tell them that, you know, that's not what it means, and individuation as well. And we need to move, remove some misconceptions. So when I have, I've spoken to many 
undergraduates about this and many law students as well, people think that every person's fingerprints are unique, that every time a source creates a print, it's the same, and that every latent print provides sufficient information to distinguish these things. And yet when I tell them, you know, most people these days have had their fingerprints taken for some kind of job or other, every time you put your fingerprint down, it looks different. And they're like, really? I go, yeah, you know, you put it down this way, and the guy's standing behind you and you roll your fingers this way, or you're grabbing a glass, or you're smearing it on a wall, right? Every time you, oh yeah. And if every time you put down a fingerprint, it looks that different, and every time somebody else puts down a fingerprint, that it looks different, even if you two have different fingerprints, sometimes those two things may look very the same. And I loved your sort of visual of that. Um, but we can't get talked to jurors about statistics because the scaffolding already exists for it. You know, we're asking jurors to do a lot of things that involve statistical evidence. Um, the probability that uh, somebody recognized somebody else, that when somebody says it's 10 o'clock at night, it might have been plus or minus a few minutes. So really, we just need to figure out a way to get this sort of st statistical information into the same kind of format. And um, so I think that people really understand the importance of variability in statistics. So let me give you an example about how to relate it to fingerprints. And I think you do this by analogy to explain likelihood ratio notes. Now, I think analogy is a very, I spent a lot of years studying it. It's a very powerful way to get people to understand things. So here's one of my favorite analogies. You're supposed to be awake enough to laugh. Thank you to those of you who did. It's like, wait a second, is it this way? Is it this way? Dogs, people, pants. And you're doing all these things mentally to try to map up, match up these two situations. And and this, this, is, this is just machinery that we have naturally, to use stuff that we already know and to map it onto stuff that we need to know. So to use analogy to explain likelihood ratios, you might ex talk to people about things that they already know. So something we already know a lot about is face recognition. You say to people, you know, do you realize that your face looks different every day? Sometimes you go in the mirror and you go, oh my god, it's a bad hair day, or what is that on my face, or I look like I got no sleep, yet you still recognize yourself in the mirror. What about your friends? You recognize your friends every day, even though they don't look the same all the time. Okay, what about if you're going to a high school reunion 20 years ago? Then you see somebody who looks kind of familiar, but you're not really sure, is this Nikki, is this Julie, who could it be? You start thinking back what you know, and you know, you're doing all these things to try to figure out what information could I use to disambiguate who they are. And if one of them happened to be you know, six foot nine and the other was five foot two, you're not like, oh, right, I can't mix up those two. But if they both have kind of very similar characteristics, uh, you might be more likely to do so. There's um, a really cute implicit learning task that shows how people can really pick up on variability pretty quickly. So suppose I tell you that there's an artist named Smith, and this is the kind of artist that she draws, the kind of art that she makes. She uses 10 by 10 grids, and she fills in a lot of stuff with black squares and some with white squares. And what I want you to do is sort of learn about the kinds of drawing that Smith makes. You never see this drawing, but you're gonna see some other art. And does it come from Smith? And I show you some ones that come from, oh yeah, that one, okay, that one comes from Smith. And what that one is, is five blacks turn to whites and whites turn to black. Oh yeah, this one comes from Smith, that's 10 blacks turn to whites and whites turn to blacks. And then I teach you about some other artists named Wilson. And here's one thing by Wilson, but you know, Wilson's pictures don't all look the same. And sometimes we can switch 10 or 15 or 20 variations on his blacks to whites and whites to black. So it turns out over time, if you teach people about enough of these things, and they can identify the Smith ones, and they can identify the Wilson ones. Now think about this as you know, two different people generating fingerprints. Smith's fingerprints will look a little bit like Smith, and Wilson's fingerprints look a little bit like Wilson's. But sometimes you can vary how much, how degraded they are. You can change five things, you can change 10 things, you can change 25 things. And sometimes they start really looking a lot alike, and sometimes they don't look a lot alike. So when do we confuse them? Well, when things get, a lot of them get changed, 
But suppose Smith's only changes a little bit across them, and Wilson's changes a lot, and then you see a target print, a target uh, picture. You, what people do with that is they map it on to Smith and Wilson according to the right probabilities based on what they would have gotten given how variable Wilson's prints are and how very narrow Smith's prints are. So in some very broad sense, Smith's prints might be like the prints you would only get from one person. They only range a certain amount. But Wilson's prints, you could get lots of different prints from lots of different people that would cover this range. Can you tell those two things apart? So these are all ways to sort of convey a sense of probability and variability to people based on things that they already know, absent using a lot of uh, statistics and having them leave your classroom or just go by who's wearing the nicer white coat in the courtroom. Um, so if we have doubts about how to present forensic comparisons, evidence explicitly with statistics, we should take what fact finders already know and we try to develop a better understanding of statistics and what we're trying to tell them with forensics based on that kind of stuff. So that's it. Okay, great. Bobby. Don't, don't disappear too quickly because we've, we've got to ask you questions. Oh. Let me ask first. I mean, so. I th um, you, I mean, I th I th you didn't have time for questions? Uh, oh. I oh, okay. oh, well, we'll, we'll have gen one question for you, then we'll do general questions okay. for the panel. Yes, but, sir. Uh, I mean, so, so I, t I take your point, I think, that, that um, you can give people an intuitive sense of the variability right. of things by giving them exemplars, like the Smith and Wilson right. thing. But, um, but are you suggesting that, I mean, one, one of the advantages of statistics is that it's a, it's a simple, straightforward, quick way to summarize variability. I mean, you're, are you suggesting that, that Henry, rather than giving a statistic, should say, oh, let me show you a few same source prints and what they look like, and let me show you a few different source prints and see what they look, I mean, yes. are, it, you, so you, you, yes. really, you really think that uh, giving exemplars is going to be possible uh, as, a, as a means of conveying the probative value of something like fingerprints or tool Wait, marks or I wish, without? I wish I had a stenographer who could read back to me what it was that you just said. Statistics are a simple, straightforward way of presenting information or something like that? To scientists. Who asked? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And so not necessarily to jurors or to lawyers or to your clients or to the population out there who's watching CSI. Can't we sometimes try to convince them that it really should be understood in some other way? F fair enough. Okay, uh, let's go to, I, I guess we could take questions for anybody on the panel, but go ahead, Henry. When we were trying to figure out how we were going to begin reporting our, our stuff, the big thing that, the challenge that we had was that, I think several of you here have presented it, that approximately 95% of cases are solved outside of court. Right. And we really don't, we're, as a federal agency, we rarely go to court state and locals go more, and still 95% roughly of these cases are solved outside of court. So the challenge is, how do we convey in essentially one page all of this information and in a way that maximizes the interpretation of the recipient of the report? And so, you know, again, I'll say, what, so I, I, I love how you presented your information and I agree wholeheartedly with that. And in fact, when we did go to testify to the results of FR stat. When, when we actually testified, we used zero numbers. We had the ability to present PowerPoints and educate the jury. What, is the, what are the features we're looking at? And, and what, did, what are the features we utilize in this case? And we showed them the two distributions and the, where the score lived. And we explained it and said, you know, this score is the results of this, this comparison. And it lives in the zip code of same source impressions and outside of the zip code from different source impressions. Um, so, you know, and this was help what informed our opinion and so forth. But the challenge really boils down to how do we articulate this on our report um, for all recipients of the report to understand and interpret properly. I mean, I th there's a real difference. When I'm talking about this, you know, for juries, fact finder, for clients, for people out there, it's for mm, people who are not really repeat players, right? I mean, you want to have the statistical report for um, people who use it over and over again. Um, but 
I don't know. It's got to be way. W would you recommend putting the actual distributions in a report in this kind of uh, fact-based cartoon illustration? Because those are, those are the types of things that I'm very interested in, of how can we practically integrate these concepts into our reports, because that's the key. Right now, I would say we're not in an, operating in an ideal state. We go to court and we, and we have the ability to show the pictures, right. but when we report, it's just a number along with a, and then we've given them the threshold, which we found has been effective, so we've taken our probability ratio and essentially yeah. treating it like a score in a way. So that I'd be interested in your thoughts of how we can improve our reports versus necessarily the testimony because we have much more power as when we're present to educate and convey this in different ways as, and we can feed off of the, re, the reactions right. from the juries. Right. I hadn't really um, thought about using it in other situations and obviously this whole point that 95% of the time it's not being used in court. I, I think you probably could. But like I said, it's not necessary for people here or for very often repeat players, but why not? So see safe, maybe you can study that for us. <laughs> we'll put it on the list. Yeah. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Oh wait, and can I finish? I mean, it reminds me of the what Harry used, the kind of nice gra graphs showing on overlapping, non-overlapping distributions. So Henry, just to add on what you're talking there and complicate it, I've actually had with a straight face the conversation with people. We've so, like say on a biology report, we include allele tables and probability calculations and those things. And we get questions of, I don't need all of that, I just need a summary. So these conflicting pressures in reports is enormous and very difficult for laboratories to split. You're trying to write a report that satisfies the neophyte who doesn't have resources enough to look past page, look past the first paragraph. You've got something that may go to an appeal later on, and that's the only piece of information in there, and that goes back to um, Melinda's Diaz, because the lab report in Melinda's Diaz was a one-liner, it done be cocaine, and that's it. Well, the foggiest idea if it was a good result or not. There's nothing in there. But you're trying to accomplish all of these things with a report. Where do we aim at? Who's getting the report? Who's yeah, exactly. The report? It's used by multiple different people <clears throat> from law enforcement investigator, um, where when you try and create a report that is more investigative in nature and caveat the crap out of the thing so that it doesn't get used for somebody to file <laughs> charges on, guess what you end up doing? Um, I mean, it's very difficult to aim at this part. and. I mean, you say you start putting graphs on there, I, I, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll give you odds, but I'll bet you, you'll be having the discussion of why are we putting that graph on there and I just need a summary. Well, why, why can't you do all of the, all, all of the above? Well, that, that's uh, I, I, I've read many, many, many expert reports in civil discovery, and they typically start with an executive summary. Uh, they then provide detailed analysis of how the method was done. So, and then I've also read um, fingerprint reports, uh, mostly state, uh, and they are one-pagers. Uh, they say we use the ACV method, uh, and we found X number of points, and there, we, our conclusion is that there's a match. That's it. They don't say they don't. They don't show pictures. They don't show what points. They don't say when they identified the point. Uh, was it before or after they looked at the latent print? Uh, there are all sorts of methodological points. Uh, excuse the, the pun there. That ought to be articulated in the report. And in fact, I, as I mentioned to to Judge Rakoff, uh, I think that the one biggest. Um, reform that could be achieved would be through these reports. And if you required, I, I think you would have a sea change, if you required in all criminal cases, state and federal, that the reports be as extensive as they are in civil discovery and that they be posted publicly uh, to a web page so that they are available to academic scientists to review and possibly peer review, uh, you would see a, a quite different uh, level of analysis that would be done. So what I've been after for a number of years now is, so I was chair of the toxicology section when Melinda's Diaz was going through and it got, um, request came around to try and do an amicus brief from the academy in that because of the circumstances that the report was it done be cocaine and that was it. Um, and it 
illustrated to me the necessity to try and get all of that information into the original report, because how else can you ensure that it's actually going to be part of the case record all the way through? Mm -hmm. Now, what it's taken me is a decades-long odyssey trying to figure out how to do that of that report containing all of the underlying information in that report. And even in the current lab that I'm working with, that has meant re-engineering the network, re-engineering what laboratory information management system we use. I'm, I'm still probably several years away from having everything in the place where you could actually get the information to flow where it needs to. I agree. I think that report needs to have that stuff in there. But what you're asking of the laboratory system to do is a, is a large investment. Well, I, let me just follow up a little bit, and I'm happy to talk to you offline about this. Um, I do think that the GDI insight uh, should drive how the reports are structured. Uh, and so some of what you could do to provide both information to the trial court as well as the opponent, as well as the appellate court, is to first of all provide a umbrella statement of the most general, what the, what the phenomena is that you're studying, what the parameters are that you are evaluating, how you move from the general to the specific to say something about this instant case, and then what you can say about this particular case. And so I, I do think that there's actually a very logical progression from what, the, so in DNA, you know, we, we do begin, uh, intuitively at, at the least, with what the uh, DNA molecule looks like. And then the question is, how do you uh, pull information from that to come up with a random match probability? And that statistical inference from the most general of what the DNA molecule provides in terms of information down to what the random match probability is in this particular case is actually a very logical progression that could be provided. And a lot of that information would be just repeated in report after report, but you shouldn't assume that every judge knows that more general information. Well, and they, another aspect that we've done is we've got a little, following after Virginia was where some of the idea came, all the procedures are on a publicly available website, but then we also have all quality incidents are there, all of the, basically the stuff that goes between cases. So then my next question is for lawyer types, how do I get you to go use it? It's all there. How do we get you to go use it? Okay, Heidi, go ahead. Just okay. Okay. It's so just we'll, we'll give we'll give Heidi, no, Heidi Eldridge gets the last word. Oh goodness, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, <laughs> I just want to follow up on the discussion you're just having about the reports with one more perspective, I guess, with the sort of competing goals and competing. Um, clientele that we have really. It's almost like two completely separate reports are required because I've been in laboratories where we've had these debates, we've made these efforts, we've said let's be really complete, let's be really transparent, let's throw it all in the report and then they'll know exactly what, we'll what we're talking about. And we issue a 20-page you know, report or a one-page report with a 40-page appendix. And the next day I'm getting a phone call from the DA or from the investigator, sorry, saying you've sent me this huge thing I just want to know was it an ID or not. They don't want to read it, they don't care, they want the bottom line. Now, I understand we have different goals for the court system, but we're only turning out one document, and it becomes a really difficult balancing act. So, I think we, should, we, we, we need to, to stop now, or pause. You can all keep talking, you can all stay, but we have out-of-town guests who probably need to get rest. I also want to note that uh, the journal editors are taking out-of-town participants to dinner at 6, and if some of you don't have rides, meet outside your hotel uh, 10 minutes before 6 o'clock. Yeah, outside the little gatehouse. So for those of you who need rides to get something to eat tonight, you will not be stranded. Just, uh, and if those of you have extra spaces in your cars and are taking out-of-town participants or have room for out-of-town participants, please you know, pull up there to offer our, our visitors. Um, huge thanks especially to all of you who traveled some, some quite long distances to be here with us today. And huge thanks to the Virginia Journal of Criminal Law, to CSAFE, to NIST. We have a lot of people to thank. We've already thanked people. In the morning, we need to thank them, everyone again at the end of the day. And let's you know, keep these conversations going. We don't have to leave the room now, but some of you may need a break. Thank you, thank you all so much. This was wonderful. Thank you.